start in earnest our discussion of entity completeness, having danced around it for a long time. <clears throat> so we are now starting chapter five, right? Five? Um, so we've defined this class ND, and I keep saying blah, blah, blah. Uh, there are things that are as hard as anything else, and so, and we've already defined uh, that a problem is, so let's say that V is a problem in NP um, and again I mean it is a problem with a capital P like Hamiltonian path is a problem not does this particular graph have a Hamiltonian path so it is NP complete if there is a reduction a polynomial time reduction which I will write like this so there is a polynomial time reduction from A to B for every problem A in NP. Okay, so every other problem in the entire class can be reduced to B. And again, I, so I think this word reduce is a terrible word. I wish I could go back in time and change it. Because it sounds as if we're making the problem smaller somehow. Yeah. What we're doing is turning it into a larger, more general problem. So saying that A can be reduced to B again means that B is at least as hard as A. And so this means that B is at least as hard as any other problem in NP. Which means it sits at the top somehow. <coughs> So every other problem in A can be reduced to this one. OK. So um, let's give our first example of an NP-complete problem. You might find it slightly disappointing. Um, but well, here's the idea. So we're going to call it witness existence. So what is the input to witness existence? A program in your favorite language. Um, and this program, it takes inputs x comma, and w, x comma w. And an integer t. But I'm going to play a slightly technical trick here. Usually we give the, if when we have programs that take integer inputs, we usually give those inputs in binary. I'm deliberately going to give you t in a wasteful format, namely in unary, which means I'm going to give you a string of t1s. This seems like a very strange thing to do, and it is, but we'll explain why in a moment. And finally, I give you an input x. And the question is, is there a w, a witness, such that if you feed this pair, x and w, to the program pi, it returns yes after 
at most T steps. Okay? <coughs> so stepping back, I mean, remember that, so as we talked over, about over the last few lectures, the nature of NP is this kind of, there exists a witness or a proof for something. And there's a polynomial time algorithm, pi, or a polynomial time program, which takes pairs of things, inputs and witnesses, and checks to see if the witness W works as a witness for the input X. So an example that you could have in mind here is that X is a graph, W is a path, pi checks W and makes sure that it is a Hamiltonian path. Okay? So let's say that pi checks that W is a Hamiltonian path for the graph X. Okay, so remember that whenever a problem or a property is in NP, there's a polynomial time algorithm that checks pairs an input and a witness. And then saying that X, saying that a graph X is Hamiltonian is the same as saying there exists a witness W, a path such that this path checking program will return yes. So that part of this, even though I'm stating it in a very general abstract form, should look very familiar to you. Well, the question is how do we limit the amount of, the, the, the time that we run this program? How do we make sure that it's a polynomial time program? Well, you see me limiting it to t steps, where I give t as part of the input. And this is why I do this very strange thing of giving you t in this wasteful format. The point is that now, if n is the total number of bits of input, Because I use one bit for each one of t here, then I ensure that t is less than or equal to n. Because I'm using n bits, I'm using t bits to write down t. And I do this for the sole purpose of making sure that when I say that, it, that the program pi is only allowed to run for t steps, that that running time is polynomial as a function of the total size of the input I give to this problem, the witness existence problem. Okay. Um, yes. I'm just trying to understand T. Is it is it like uh, <coughs> the number of edges, for example, in this yeah. in this uh, graph, or is this, does it affect uh, the runtime of pi? Well, I mean, in practice, uh, you know, how long does it take you to check that W is a, pa is a path through X? Let's say it takes you, you know, at most N time or N squared time, or I'll be generous. I'll give you, you know, N to the 10th, where that N is the number of vertices. Okay. So then this N will be like the number of vertices to the 10th, because I'm going to make it big enough for you. Right, but the idea is that what I want to prevent, I want to prevent you from actually running some kind of exponential time problem, program here, and checking something much more complicated than an NP problem, right? So if you had something where the checker took exponential time, that would be some higher complexity class. And we're just making sure you can't do that because then you would have to make this input exponentially large. If I gave you t in binary, then it could be as big as 2 to the n. Okay? So I know this, this thing is a little bit weird, it's a little confusing, but it, the sole purpose is to cap the running time of pi at the size of the input of 
the witness existence problem. So I claim this problem is NP complete. So, um, so first of all, a, a note to the experts. Um, in many cases, the first, the kind of root NP complete problem, or in the version of the book you have, it's we call it the Ur problem. That's using a word from German, which we'll probably take out because nobody knows what an Ur problem is. It means the root problem from which all other things are derived. So this is going to be our root problem for NP-completeness. Now, what many people do is they talk about Turing machines and non-deterministic Turing machines. So, you know, in this book we've made a very deliberate choice to de-emphasize Turing machines because the point is that you all know how to write programs and you know that programs take a certain amount of time and use a certain amount of memory. And so why should we go through this much stranger model of computation? I mean, they're very cute. We'll, we will talk about Turing machines later this semester. But there's no real need to use Turing machines as part of the definition of P or NP. Because you know in your heart that if you have a program written in Scheme that solves a problem in polynomial time, that there also exists a program written in C that solves the same problem in polynomial time. And you know that that's the same for all programming languages. Um, you know that these things are interconvertible. So that's why I'm not going to specify what language this program is written in. You can specify that for yourself. Use whatever language you're most comfortable thinking about. Okay. So first, I claim that this problem is in NP. OK. <coughs> is that clear? Tell me what that means. So in, I mean. If somebody provides some witness to us, we can check that in polynomial time. Yeah, so if someone, so the witness for this problem is the thing it's asking for, W. And then how do I check in polynomial time that this is true? Byte. Run it. Yes. Yeah. Um, this byte. Yeah, so, so run the program pi and see what it does. Yeah. Or if you prefer the word simulate, you can use the word simulate. But let's use the word run. Again, if we were back in 1936 saying run the program and see what it does, those words were not yet known to make sense. Because the very idea of a universal computer which can be programmed to do all sorts of different things was only just then being born. But nowadays, we can say, run the program and see what it does. And you all know what that means. Interpret it. Compile it and run it. Run it. OK. And because we only need to run it for t steps, and because t is at most the number of bits of input, well, clearly, in roughly n steps, you'll know whether it returns yes or no. I mean, it might still be running, okay? But you'll know whether it returns yes. So this problem is in NP. Now prove to me it's NP complete. Well, it's NP complete because it's just restating the whole definition of NP. It, the, we defined NP to be the set of problems for which there is a polynomial program, which takes inputs and witnesses and checks them, such that the answer to the input is yes if there is a witness that makes this checker program return yes. For instance, as we wrote down here, I claim that Hamiltonian path can be reduced to this problem by letting <coughs> pi be the program which checks graphs and paths to see if that path is a Hamiltonian path for that graph. And because that program exists and because you can write it down, you can then code up the Hamiltonian path problem in this general form and hand that program to this problem as input. So I claim this is our first NP-complete problem. 
It's in NP because of this upper bound we impose on the running time of the program. And so that we're only obligated to simulate it for polynomial time. <coughs> and it's NP complete because by definition, every NP complete problem can be phrased this way for some program pi. <laughs> All right. This yeah. this is important. I mean, it's yes. But don't NP complete problems can't they take you know exponential time to give you an answer? It's true that they might take exponential time to solve deterministically. Right. That's because it might take you exponential time to search through all the possibilities and find a witness W. But they have if you hand W to me. I can check that in polynomial time, and that's what we're saying here. Yeah. Yes? Uh, do we need to think about exponential time or not, or just we need to think about checking the answer for exponential time? I think for this, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't even need to know. You don't even need to think about the search process today. We're only thinking about the checkability properties of NP problems. So today, what's important for us is not that it takes a long time to find a Hamiltonian path. What's important is that if you show me one, or one that you claim is one, I can check it quickly. The same for colorings, the same for truth assignments in a formula, and so on. Yes? If you have a problem in NP, you can prove that. And then you want to know if it's also in NP complete. You want to prove or disprove that. How do you do so? Well, it's hard to disprove. Right. To, to prove, you just need to reduce another NPC right. problem. Well, so here's what we're going to do. Um, now that we have <coughs> our first NP complete problem, witness existence, or WE for short, if you believe my claim that by definition every other problem can be reduced to witness existence, well, now I can prove that other problems are NP complete by reducing witness existence to them. And the nice thing is that this property that, and one of the reasons why we write it like this, like less than, this property that A can be reduced to B is transitive. If A can be reduced to B and B can be reduced to C in polynomial time, then A can be reduced to C in polynomial time. That should be fairly obvious. Just translate from A to B and then translate from B to C. Okay, so if you can convert an example of A to an example of B, then you can convert that to an example of C, and then you can convert an example of A to an example of C. So the NCR in NP complete? So what we're going to do is that rather than proving from scratch each time that our favorite problem, that any other problem in NP can be reduced to it, it suffices to take some other problem that we already know is NP-complete and reduce it to our problem. So we're going to build a kind of family tree of NP-complete problems, starting with this one as our root. Now, you asked about disproving. Um, nobody knows how to prove that something isn't NP-complete. But you mentioned that, like, the prime, which is last prime, you, you say... It well, that turns out to be NP. Yeah, but... But keep in mind that if P and NP are the same, they're all NP-complete, too. Yeah, but it was thought to be, I mean, not in P and not in NP-complete, either, right? I mean, it's just an assumption, or, I mean, it's not proof, or... I mean. Well, now that we know that primality is in P, yeah. it could be NP-complete, but if it is, that's because P equals NP. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so we, we just want to know if there's a class that exists outside of NP complete. Oh, there are bigger classes. So you have an OVO that could be P equals NP, and you have on top of that you have NP complete. So we want to know if there's something in between there. Okay, so there's two possibilities. Um, one of them is this. The other is this. <coughs> so
So I mentioned last time that we do know that if P and NP are different, then there are things in the middle. Then there are many gradations of hardness within NP with NP completeness at the top. <coughs> is it still difficult to prove that? Well, the thing is that if we knew that this was the situation, then we would know that P and NP are different. So we know something conditional. Okay? But, I mean, we know that if P and NP are different, then the world looks like this. I mean, we, we, we know that the world does not look like okay. this, for instance. But, but I mean, just like the pri primary problem you mentioned, right? It ha has, when it, it was not proved to be in P, we believe it is not, it is not in NP complete, right? I mean, we believe it is in somewhere in between, right? I, I don't think we, we, we didn't ever, well, I, you know, I'm not sure how much our beliefs matter, but okay. I, uh, we didn't ever believe that primality was NP complete, to my knowledge. Okay. So how did because you... because there were all, for instance, it's in we. Once you know it's in the intersection of of NP and co NP, right? I mean, we don't we we because we believe that NP and co NP are different. We believe that for NP complete problems like Hamiltonian path. There is not a simple witness, an easily checkable witness of non-existence of a Hamiltonian path. So, um, so I mean, it's, it's not a strict proof. I mean, it's not an anti-complete. They, they just kind of believe it. It is not anti-complete, right? I mean, at right. that point. Yes. Yeah. So just believe. <laughs> well. <laughs> What we can prove, we can prove a lot of conditional things, right? So, for instance, if Hamiltonian path is outside P, so, I mean, we haven't proved that Hamiltonian path is NP-complete yet. So we can prove that Hamiltonian path is solvable in polynomial time if and only if every other problem in NP is also solvable in polynomial time. So we can prove relationships between hardness. We can prove that if this problem is hard, then that one is hard. If this one is easy, then that one is easy. But we still don't know that, I mean, they could all be easy, or they could all be hard. Yeah. And that's the P versus NP question, and that's what we don't know. OK. <clears throat> all right. So does everybody understand this thing about this, how we're going to build this family tree of NP-complete problems, starting with this one? Because, you know, a problem out here, every problem in NP can be reduced to it because you can reduce it to witness existence and then to this problem and then to this problem and then to this problem. And yes, in a sense, these all, these all loop around, right? Because these problems are also in NP, so they could also be phrased in this general way again. It's kind of, kind, of, kind of weird that the witness existence problem, is, I mean, the problem is that it's kind of a witness, right? It's kind of check. That's why it is, I mean, by definition, can I mean, an NP complete, right? I, mean, I you're saying the problem itself is a witness? I'm not sure I know what you mean. I, I mean, the way you define it like this is because uh, it's a kind of definition of NP problems, right? You can, you can check it in polynomial time. Right. right. It, what, what it's doing is, I mean, what we've done here is just phrase the definition of NP as a problem. But it's kind of weird that with the other NP problems, I mean, to solve it and to check it, <coughs> it's kind of different. I mean, kind of, Cost us different time and you know, different complexities. But I mean, this problem itself, it seems like, I mean, I don't know what we're talking about, but is your kind of witness or witness, something like that? <laughs> well, the witness is, that's the witness. Well, let's talk, let's take this offline and we can sure. talk about it more. Um, okay, so uh, let's. Our next NP complete problem is going to be this uh, circuit satisfiability. 
and the input will be a Boolean circuit. So what does that mean? Um, it's going to be a, uh, it's not, for the neural networks people, it's going to be feed forward as opposed to recurrent. <coughs> so what will happen is there'll be a set of input bits here at the top. And then there'll be a series of gates and NOR gates and some NOT gates. And it's going to go through a whole bunch of layers. And finally, at the output, at the bottom, there'll be some output Z. And I'm going to say that an input satisfies the circuit if it makes the output true. And the question is, is it are there any output? Are there any inputs that make the output true? So this is a little. This is a lot like what we talked about with hardware verification before, where we arrange the circuit to check the you know a division chip by multiplying the output by one of the inputs and seeing if you get the other input back. Remember that diagram that we drew when we were making fun of Intel, and if there if it didn't get the right answer, um, then it gets. Uh, then it outputs true because it detects an error. And so in that case, the question of, of is the circuit satisfiable was, is there an input that makes some part of the circuit give the wrong answer? But that was just an example. So for today, we're just asking, is there any input that makes the output true? So that's the question. Does there exist truth assignments x1 through xn such that z will be true. Now, <clears throat> notice that I have to give you the whole schematic, the whole map of this circuit as part of the input. OK. So if I want to ask you about larger circuits with more layers and more gates, I need to give you a larger input. <coughs> so first of all, prove to me that this problem is in NP. Given the set of assignments. In. Given the assignment, what do you do? Plugging in. Going through the circuit. And because I have to give you the whole map of the circuit, the number of inputs, uh, sorry, the number of gates is polynomial in the size of the total input I hand you, because I have to give you the whole thing all at once. And so the time it takes to, to go through it is polynomial as a function of the input size. It's worth, I mean, what we're saying here is not tautological, right? I mean, this is important, because you can imagine a different kind of problem where I give you a very compact description of a really big circuit, <coughs> right? I mean, I could tell you, okay, here's a little, very small description of a bunch of modules. And I tell you, okay, now take two to the end of these modules and wire them up in this way. And now the circuit is much bigger than the description of it I gave you. And now going through it could take much more than polynomial time. So in that situ situation, satisfiability could be much harder than NP. It might not be checkable in polynomial time. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. But here you have to give me the whole thing explicitly so it's in NP. So I claim this is NP complete. Why is this NP complete? Why is this just as hard as this? This can reduce to this? Reduce to what? That's the question. What can you do to a program? What is, you know, we said run the program. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a software thing to say. What's a hardware thing to say? You can consider x1 to xn be the integer t. Uh, well, remember, I'm trying to convert this to that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so put yourself in the 1950s. 
go to the hardware store, buy a whole bunch of and, or, and not gates, <laughs> vacuum tubes or whatever. You have a program. You have a program and a certain number of steps that you want the program to run. <coughs> you sit down and you build a circuit which runs the program. <coughs> if the circuit does many steps, uh, up to t steps, well, you know that you can do a build a circuit where, you know, the memory of the uh, of the computer that the program is running on is represented by a bunch of Boolean values. And you know that each step of the program does something to these values, updates them in some way. Okay. And that's one layer of your circuit. And then you have at most, yeah, you have at most T layers. <coughs> You know the circuit isn't too wide because if I only let the program run for t steps, it only has time to play with up to t different bits in its memory. So that's like the width of the circuit. The depth is like the number of, is like the, the number of times it runs. And then the output is sitting in some bit. There's z. <coughs> Does this make sense? I mean, what we're talking about here is the notion of compilation, right? That you know because you have these things on your desks that you can take any program and let's say that we're going to hard code it. So we could compile it down to a bunch of really tiny elementary operations on, on bits, you know? Take all the additions, all the multiplications, code them up in, go all the way down into machine code and a really horrible machine code that doesn't let you multiply 62, 64-bit integers at once. Go farther back in time than that and really design a chip that runs the program. And you know we can do that because, again, in the early 21st century, these ideas are very familiar that Boolean circuits can do anything we want. Right. Is this the this is totally obvious look or the I'm lost look? Lost. <laughs> we can also convince ourselves of this because any program, no matter in what language we write, it, it runs on Boolean circuits. Yes, exactly. I mean, the computer the computer on your desk is a Boolean circuit. It can be more magical or powerful than that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a nice, it's a clever Boolean circuit which is arranged so that by setting some of its inputs, I can program it to act like a wide variety of other Boolean circuits. And that programmability is a very clever idea. But at the root, uh, if I just asked you to make me a specialized chip that runs this program and nothing else, well, you could certainly do that. Yeah. Okay. Just one way. Yeah. You choose this one to like the second and be complete. Start with that one. Just, I mean, this idea of just hardware setting up is kind of more intuitive. Or uh, well, I mean, well, from this we're going to go to lots of more familiar problems, right? Um, but the point is that, you know, NP is defined in terms of a polynomial time program that checks witnesses. Mm -hmm. Well, this means that, this basically means that questions about any device that can do things like run programs, questions about whether it will say yes in a polynomial time, are probably going to be NP complete. And one universal substrate, one universal way to do computation is Boolean circuits. Okay. All right, so again, for the connoisseurs, if we were doing this in terms of Turing machines, then we could write this circuit down in a really explicit way. But I don't feel like it. And if you know that, then you already know that. So why should I tell it to you? So I'd rather talk about programming and compiling programs all the way down into machine code and eventually into hardware, and that's a Boolean circuit. Okay. 
But I do want you to understand that the number of layers is proportional to the running time, and the width is proportional to the total number of bits that the program will use in its memory. That's important because later on in the semester we'll talk a bit about the theory of parallel computation. All right. So, if you believe now that circuit satisfiability is NP complete, now from there we can go lots of other places. <clears throat> and actually, we've kind of already talked about one of these. So, let's see. Here's our, let's make our family tree over here. Witness existence, circuit sat. Now, let's go from here to 3 sat. So here's the idea. Um, you know, a, a circuit is this layout where each gate gets its inputs from the outputs of some other gates or directly from the input variables. And, you know, a, a three sat formula is this kind of flat thing where I have a series of clauses. But as we talked about last time, I can encode in 3SAT form <coughs> claims like this. I can, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invent a bunch of additional variables. I'll call these the Ys. And they will represent the truth values being carried by the internal wires of the circuit. So consider this gate. I want to write in 3SAT form the claim that it works, that y1 equals the end of x1 or x2. And I gave this to you as an exercise last time. Um, and let's see, how did we do it? Uh, well, I want it to be the case that if x1 is false, then y1 is false. I also want it to be the case that if x2 is false, then y1 is false. Finally, I want it to be the case that if x1 and x2 are both true, y1 is forced to be true. Take a moment to parse that or choose one of the clauses and parse it, right? I mean, this says that if x1 is false, then y1 is false. That's certainly true if y1 is the end of the two inputs. Same thing here. And this says, well, if x1 and x2 are both true, the only remaining way to satisfy this clause is to set y1 to be true. Notice that this alone is not enough, right? Okay. Because this clause is happy if y1 is true, no matter what x1 and x2 are. But then these other clauses come in. These clauses say, well, if y1 is true, um, then, uh, then x2 is forced to be true, and x1 is forced to be true. So I claim that the combination of these three clauses enforces the relationship that y1 equals x1 and x2. Okay. Well, now I claim it's a straightforward to take the map of a circuit, which you've given me as part of the input, and convert it to a big 3SAT formula. For each gate, it has clauses like this that force the gate to do what it's supposed to. And after all of those, it finally says, oh, by the way, I demand that Z is true. So this is a mixture of one, two, and three variable clauses. We'll fix that little glitch in a moment. but. If I have these clauses for each gate, and if I demand that z is true, is it clear that this formula is satisfiable if and only if this circuit is satisfiable? 
I mean, you didn't do yourself nasty. Mm -hmm. The second level. Sorry? What? I mean, is it, it is true for the... Okay, so you, oh yeah, you assign each Gaiden variable here. Okay. I mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, saying there exists an input which makes the output true, this is identical to the following fancier statement, which is, there exists a set of truth values for the inputs and for all the internal wires okay. and for Z such that all the gates work the way they're supposed to and Z is true. Is this reduction still still in polynomial time? You tell me. Is this a, is this is this reduction in polynomial time? Can we do this in polynomial time? Polynomial is a function of what? Yeah, the total the total number of gates and wires in the circuit. Yeah. Well, it looks like it's a pretty straightforward process to just invent dummy variables for all the wires and then go linearly through all the gates and produce this formula. So I claim that this is a polynomial time process. I mean, you should imagine that I've handed the 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 uh, you, that I've handed you the map of the circuit in some format you're comfortable with. A list of gates for each one, uh, you know, numbers telling you which other gates feed into it and where its output goes and something like that. Okay. So. Um, there's this mildly annoying thing that, strictly speaking, 3SAT is supposed to have exactly three variables per clause. Here we have one variable. Here we have two. Well, show me how to take a two-variable clause and convert it to one or more three-variable clauses such that they're both satisfiable, if and only if this one is satisfiable. Well, we just, just might put a dummy variable, you know, Q and one, yes, and then not Q and the next one, and link them like that. Yeah, well, so our first impulse is just to add a dummy variable here. But this is bad because if Z is true, the whole thing is satisfied. You force it to be false. But for the other terms. Yeah. So what we do is we also do this. Yeah. And now whatever Z is, X or Y has to be true. There's an even more trivial way to do this if you're allowed to repeat variables. Just do something like this. But if for some reason you decided that you're not allowed to repeat variables, then anyway, okay. So it's pretty easy to pump the number of variables up to three. All right. So I claim that three set is NP complete. Yes. So we just have to make sure that the expansion, when we go from like and or not, none of those give like an exponential number of clauses. That's important too, yeah. I mean, the total length here needs to be a polynomial function of the size of the circuit. But in fact, it's linear in the size of the circuit because each gate only gives a constant number of clauses. But yes, that we do need to check that. Like maybe if you put it into disjunctive form, it would totally blow up the number of them. Mm, yes, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, so... It's, it's true that you can convert from conjunctive form to disjunctive form, right? So disjunctive form is an, is an or of ands instead of an and of ors. Well, yeah. and how much well, bigger does the formula get when you do that? That's a, a good question. Um, all right, so, you know, I mean, the moral so far is that it's still, I mean, this is NP-complete by definition. This is NP-complete because Boolean circuits are universal computers. This is NP-complete because 3SAT clauses are a powerful and general way, a powerful and general enough way to talk about constraints so that they can impose the constraints that say that the circuit works. Right? So going, running a program or going through a circuit both seem like dynamic processes. 
Satisfying a three-set formula doesn't look so dynamic, but the point is that by talking about constraints, three-set can enforce a kind of dynamic process. And so satisfying it can amount to running a program or running a circuit, and that's why it's NP-complete. But, I mean, it seems like to, to, to prove a question is NP-complete, you have to kind of, I mean, it's not trivial to pick up a, another NP-complete to try to convert, uh, reduce it to it. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, tri uh, tricky, right? It can be finding, proving that things are NP-complete can be tricky, yes. So, for instance, Remember uh, the problem about number partitioning. So I give you a bunch of integers, and I ask you to divide them into two groups that the totals are the same. Where's the computation in that? I mean, we're just adding things up. It's just arithmetic, and I'm just asking, can I take these brass weights and put them on two sides of the balance that the balance balances? It's hard to see any way in which that problem does universal computation, and yet it does. And we'll prove that sometime soon. So yes, I mean, and, and, but I think here before, you know, hopefully at this point, the fact that 3 side is NP-complete, it, it should start feeling kind of almost boring and obvious now. But it wasn't before, hopefully. Um, all right, well, let's, let's push on. Um, we will find, for a number of our proofs, the following variant of 3SAT rather handy, called not all equal 3SAT. So this is a handy variation because it's, it's a more symmetric version of 3SAT. So 3SAT, each time we have the or of three literals, which, you know, I'll just write them as variables. You can negate them if you want. It demands that at least one of these be true. Okay, that's what 3SAT demands. Not all equal 3SAT takes triples, and I'm not going to write it as ors because it doesn't really mean that. It demands that of these three literals, there should be at least one true and at least one false. Or to put it differently, they should not all three be true, and they should not all three be false. Hence the words, not all equal. Whereas 3SAT is very happy if all three are true. Okay. To state it one more way, and just you know, to beat this dead horse, um, if you look at the eight possible truth values, ranging from all false up to all true, um, 3SAT is happy with everyone but this one, but NAESAT is happy with everyone but this or this, and it wants one of the six possibilities remaining. Um, I'm not going to prove that NAE3SAT is NP-complete. It's in the book, and you should read the book. But first, you should try to do it yourself. Um, <clears throat> but I'll tell you one thing which, is, which isn't right, and I'll ask you why it isn't right. You could say, well, look, what does it mean for one of these three things to be true and one of them to be false? Well, that's really just a combination of two three-sat clauses. One says X or Y or Z. The other says, not x or not y or not z. This one forces at least one to be true. This one forces at least one to be false. Why does this not prove that NAE3SAT is NP-complete? This is the most common student mistake in this class, so I thought we'd just get it over with and out in the open. Why does this not prove that NAE3SAT is NP-complete? This reduces to 3 sat, but not the other. Yeah, this is a reduction from NAE sat to sat. Okay. We want the other direction, right? 
Okay. So if we already knew that NAE 3 set was NP complete, this would be a perfectly fine proof that 3 set is NP complete. But our situation is the reverse. So the challenge is to take 3 set formulas and, and rephrase them somehow as NAE 3 set formulas, possibly with some additional dummy variables. And this is slightly confusing because 3SAT is inherently asymmetric, okay? True and false are really different from 3SAT's point of view. It's happy if they're all true, or if at least one is true. It's not happy if they're all false. And ESAT is an inherently symmetric problem, and it's hard at first to see how to phrase asymmetric constraints in a symmetric way. So in other words, I, I give you... I give you symmetric tools to build with, and I ask you to build something asymmetric. That's what it would mean to express three set clauses as a combination of NAE three set clauses, and yet it can be done. All right? So, as long as we're cruising on this rapid pace, let's assume that you are going to go read the book and learn why NAE three set is NP complete, or better yet, I give you permission to skip your reading assignments if you prove it yourself. Um, so let's take it as given that NAE3 set is NP complete, and let's now prove that graph coloring is NP complete. Because this one's really fun. And this is the first problem, which at least on its face is not about Boolean anything or and and or anything, even though, yes, you can phrase it that way if you want. <coughs> so, now, if we're going to reduce from NAE3 set, what this means is that we need to express the NAE 3 sat constraint that I have three Boolean variables, and at least one must be true, and at least one must be false. They must not be all the same. I have to express that somehow in terms of colorings of vertices. And the way people usually do this and usually talk about it is they talk about a choice gadget and a constraint gadget. So the idea of a choice gadget is something that represents a Boolean variable. Since we're trying to reduce from a Boolean problem. So this would mean some little bit of the graph which can be colored in two different ways. And then one of those colorings will mean to us that a Boolean, that some corresponding variable is true. And the other coloring will mean that it's false. So what little piece of the graph could we think of that can be colored in two different ways? And when I say two different ways, well, there might be more ways than that somehow, but I'd like to focus on two of them. Tell you what, let's start by taking this one. Let's say our colors are red, green, and blue. Let's color this one red. Now, assuming that that one is red, build me something which can be colored in two different ways. Same. It's neighbor. So this can be green or blue. All right. Well, that's that's a good start. Let's say that um, let's say that x is true if this thing is green. So let's say green means true and blue means false. Well, you know that um, NAE sat formulas, some, uh, a variable might 
uh, occur in one clause, and its negation might occur in another clause. So if this is x, I think it will be very handy to also have access to not x. How do I make not x? Uh, its neighbor, and then what else? I mean, at the, at the oh, moment, yeah. this could be blue, green, or red. So. Triangle. Yeah, yeah. So here we go. So now, assuming this is red, these two can be colored green and blue or blue and green. And this will, we'll think of this as the variable x, and this is the variable not x. Great. So here's one variable. Here's another variable. Here's another variable. Oh, well, this is great. Good. Now what we need is a constraint. So a constraint would be some part of the graph to which some of these variables are connected. So if this is going to represent the triple x, y, and z, then these vertices should be wired into it somehow, and it should be possible to color it if and only if what is true about the three vertices. Remember, I want the graph to be colorable if and only if the formula is satisfiable. So what property do I want this constraint gadget to have? It should be, true to X, y, and Z. It should be impossible to color it if x, y, and z are all true, which in the coloring world means what? They're all the same color. Yeah. Or if they're all false, which again means they're all the same color. Yeah. So if they're all blue or they're all green, it should be impossible to color this gadget. Mm -hmm. But if they're not all different, it should be possible to color this gadget. So now design me a gadget that I can wire these into so that I can color it if and only if these three are not all the same color. your first adventure in gadget design. <laughs> I think it's probably you've all already read this far in the book. That's probably why you're not speaking up. No cheating. No cheating. <laughs> now stay on that page. On that page, it's a black box in front of it. So, so what should I put there? Well, graph, you know, gadget design involves a lot of doodling. So here, just toss something out. Name something and I'll doodle it for you. Oh, come on. <clears throat> Anything. I mean... Like in... Triangle. Sure, a triangle. A class two, I mean. So, like this, say? I mean, you'd better put some neighbors in between them. Well, they're neighbors of each other. Okay. Do, you want, do you want more vertices? That will not work. Just, this will not work, are you sure? Because if two of them are the same, it's not power like. Don't you need edges more? Oh, I see. Neighbor of, the neighbor of the x must be the same with negative negative So, in fact, you uh, add the other three nodes in that box. But do I have to do that? I mean, if x, y, and z are the same color, this also means that not x, not y, and not z are also all the same color. So. Oh. I could add another gadget, but I'm not sure I have to. <clears throat> well, I mean, let's keep doodling. Mm -hmm. I'm trained as a physicist, and we, we're trained 
to say something, even if we don't know if it's right. <laughs> so, whereas, you know, mathematicians are supposed to stay silent until they know the answer. <laughs> but, you know, so be, you know, you wouldn't want computer science to have necessarily the culture of old mathematics. It should be more, you know, anyway. So let's say that this is blue, this is blue, and this is green. What color should I give this one? Uh, red or green. Okay, let's make it red. And then this one is what? It has to be blue, and this one is green. No problem. <laughs> we could have done it differently. Um, this one could have been red. Yeah, and um, green. 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 Could have been red, green, blue. That would have worked. Yeah. And in fact, those are the two ways to do it. Yeah. But that's okay. It's okay if there's more than one way. Uh, we want it to not have. Yeah. So we need to make sure that it can't be colored. Yeah, it's not colorable. So by the way, notice that we don't need to check red, red, you know, green, green, blue, because by symmetry, we've already checked the case where yeah. one is different from the other two. So now let's look at where they're all the same. Um, now can we color it? No, I don't think so. Why not? You've got only two choices to it. Three of them. I mean, the problem is, yeah, so the problem is that in order to color a triangle, you need all three colors, yeah. Yeah. because each one touches the other two. So one of them would have to be blue, and that would conflict with these. But as long as one of them isn't blue, you can make the neighbor of that one blue, like this one, and then put red and green on the other. That's cool. Okay. So this gadget is colorable if and only if the corresponding NAE sat formula is satisfied. So if you have a formula with 50 variables and 100 clauses, well, you make 50 of these pairs. And for each clause, so maybe here I have another clause, which is not x, comma, y, comma, w. OK, good. So I wire those three things into a triangle. And this triangle enforces that these three things are not all the same color, and so on. And so in linear time, I can convert any NAE 3 sat formula into a graph, such that the graph is three colorable if and only if the formula is satisfiable. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And so once again, the sense is that somehow three coloring is turns out to have this powerful ability to propagate complicated logical relationships to express these constraints. Whereas two coloring doesn't. Three coloring does. Um, just for kicks, tell me how to convert this to graph K coloring for some k bigger than 3, or bigger than or equal to 3. So prove to me in 30 seconds or less that four colorability of graphs is also NP-complete. <clears throat> How do I take this graph and turn it into another one, which is four colorable, if and only if this one is three colorable? You can always name the, the, the square that has the four nodes to add another node as a three and then connect the alternate. You know what I mean? No. <laughs> okay, so we have like uh, four, four, four nodes connected to each other because let's say k equals four. So we're not going to have the triangle sign. Gonna, exactly. Uh -huh. Okay, so can, can we break that and to add another node to make it two triangles? Um. Um, you know to make it three color. I'm still a little confused. So the the our goal is to change a graph G into a graph G prime, okay. such that G is three colorable, if and only if G 
prime is four colorable. So, you know, and we need to do this in general, by the way. But so let's say that I, I have here, you know, some crazy graph. It might be three color opal, it might not. How do I convert it into a new graph, which is four colorable, if and only if this one is three colorable? And then, dummy nodes that connect to every three of them, three neighbors. Yeah, connect to all. Yeah, add a dummy, add a dummy node and connect it to everybody. Everybody, okay. Okay. Whatever color this is, you have to color these others with the other three. So if these can be colored with three colors, there'll be a fourth left over. Yeah. Conversely, if I can color all of these with four colors, then I can color these with three. Okay. Good. So we just proved that four coloring and five coloring and so on is at least as hard as three coloring, and therefore is NP complete. All right. Um, so. Uh, so as you read chapter five, which I hope you'll be able to soon, um, you know, you could sort of, you could do this stuff until the cows come home. I mean, there are literally thousands of problems in this family tree that are known to be NP complete. So what's important is getting a sense of how a number of different types of reductions work. So here we've gotten from we've gotten from Boolean things to things about coloring graphs, which is good. So what's interesting about these reductions is cases where I mean what's interesting about NP completeness is that the is that among the NP complete problems are problems that look as if they have totally different flavors from each other. It's not as if they're all about Boolean things. They're not necessarily all about constraint satisfaction. Um, so in fact, let me borrow your copy of the book. Since we have six minutes left or eight minutes left, maybe we can do one more just for kicks. Um, oh, let's do tiling. I like tiling. Do you mind if I hold on to this for a second? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very fond of these wooden puzzles and so on. So here's the problem tiling. So the input is a region, R, and a set of tiles, T. And for simplicity and to make everything nice and discreet, we're going to make both of these things just areas of the, you know, of the grid. They're going to be unions of unit squares. Okay? So they're not going to be crazy curved things. They're going to be, the region will be something like this. And the tiles will be something like, you can have these and these and those, or something like that. And the question is, and by the way, these tiles, I give you as many as you want of each kind. There's another variant of the problem where I give you a specific set of tiles, but here I'm giving you tile shapes, and you can have as many of each shape as you desire. And the question, of course, is can we tile R with tiles from T, where tiling means cover it with no gaps and no overlaps? Um, I have no idea if we can do it in this case. Let's see. Dum -de -dum. Uh, da -da -da -da. Um, well, okay, I didn't do that right, so anyway, maybe that's my fault. <laughs> so, is this in NP? Yeah, show us the diagram. Yeah, show it to you. Okay. Again, I give you the entire map of the region as part of the input. Okay. So, and actually, that's this is an important point. If what I told you was I gave you two numbers, A and B, in binary, and I ask you, can you tile an A times B rectangle, 
Well, then the problem is the solution could be exponentially large as a function of the input. But if what, if what I give you is more like, I give you like a GIF of the region, I give you an array of zeros and ones that shows you where the region is, then, then, the, si then the area of the region is proportional to the size of the input, and so it's in NP. Um, that's a good exercise, actually. Uh, Okay, so um, I, I'm like a Turing machine. I don't have internal memory. I have to write things down. So, um, all right. So now the question is: Is this NP complete? Well, why, why else would we be discussing it? So not only is it NP complete, it's NP complete for the following set of tiles. If you allow rotations. Okay. One kind of tile. Yeah, so one kind of tile. I give you one kind of tile. You can rotate them. You don't need to reflect it. And I ask you, can you fill the region with this kind of tile? Proving this is kind of tricky. It's a little bit less tricky to prove that if I give you these two kinds of tiles, then it's NP complete. Why? Well, again, you're going to build a computer. Build a computer out of these things. What does that mean? Well, you know, this is a nice two-dimensional thing, so let's take a circuit and lay it out somehow. So that tiling a region corresponds somehow to propagating truth values through the circuit. And little gadgets in the tiling will correspond to AND and OR gates. So I'm just going to give you an example, and I'm just drawing this directly from the book. Um, so for instance, here is a wire. Why is this a wire? Because there are two ways to tile it with these elbow-shaped things, which, by the way, are called right traumas. You can do it this way, or you could do it this way. And that will be our choice. So we'll just arbitrarily decide that one of these means true and one of, the, one of these means false. OK? One of the fun things about designing reductions is you get to impose meaning on the problem, right? Mm -hmm. You get to decide what, how to interpret these things, as long as you can make sure that everything is, is consistent. Um, well, here's an input which can be set one way or the other. <coughs> because I'm allowing myself to use these two by two blocks, I can either fill this one like that, or I can have a right tromino in here and then have it propagate the rest of the way. This will be an input which can be true or false. Cool. So now all we need is some gadgets for AND and OR gates. And um, without proof, I claim that if you have two wires leading into something like this, Well, start trying to tile this. I mean, this thing has elbows one way or the other. This thing has elbows one way or the other. Basically, this thing in the center will either be filled with an elbow or with a 2 by 2 square. And I claim that with the right interpretation of which of these tilings are true and which are false, that the value which comes out here is the end of the two that enter. How do you find such things? Well, you doodle. You have to doodle. Um, and so there's a little example on page 145 of a region that corresponds to a little circuit. Um, so that's a good place to stop. Next time, we will do uh, integer partitioning.
If you want, we can do independent set. And I guess we should probably do Hamiltonian path. But even telling whether a certain integral is 0 or not can be NP-complete, which I think is awfully cute. All right, see you Thursday. Um, I'm considering, uh, if you want to come to my office hours, can you let me know? Because Melanie asked me to talk to, with her about something. So if, if nobody wants to come to office hours, I'll go talk to her. Otherwise, I'll, I'm happy to make myself available.